Good evening and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the Canadian Celiac Association's webinar, Dermatitis Herpetiformis, Diagnosis and Management. This education series is generously supported by Dr. Sher. Thank you so much, Dr. Shar. I'm Gauri Bhava, a registered dietitian on the client support desk for the Canadian Celiac Association. Our presenters for the evening are Dr. Laurie Parsons, a clinical prof associate professor of dermatology in the Department of Medicine at the University of Calgary, and Megan Donnelly, a registered dietitian at, and a nutrition service manager with Dr. Shar at USA. For many of you joining us today, you must be confused and overwhelmed with the amount of information that surrounds us in connection with celiac disease, especially with lesser understood areas such as dermatitis herpetiformis. Our plan is to walk you through to learn more about the diagnosis and the management aspects of dermatitis herpetiformis in a balanced way. The Canadian Celiac Association tries to empower Canadians with celiac disease who live with celiac disease and gluten disorders to live their life the best. We are a national registered charity and we are changing every day, trying to keep up with times, trying to help and assist and support in whatever manner we can. Help us to continue advocate for safe food and offer science-based education and invest in Canadian research. The Canadian Celiac Association is a small national charity for nearly 50 years. It has been led by volunteers and experts as a source of evidence-based information and peer support. We advance advocacy on key issues such as safe food and labeling, deliver education programs and services, and invest in research and empower those living with celiac disease and gluten disorders. We offer peer support. We have a lot of peer supporters. You just need to email us or call us and let us know. Email us at client support at celiac.ca and we are here for you. We can match you up with a peer supporter. It's totally free. All you need to do is send an email or call us. We have an online Facebook group. It is over 14,000 strong and 80% active. It is an amazing place to get peer support. It is supported by the Professional Advisory Committee of the Canadian Celiac Association. There are Facebook live sessions. We do regular polls, polls and surveys to see what's happening, what is required, what information we can work on. And it is, of course, like I said, moderated by the CCA and backed by the Professional Advisory Committee made up of dietitians, doctors, and more. We have a lot of contests and giveaways to a lot of time. Well... Better, free, Better Living Gluten-Free is one of our online magazines and Canadians step up for celiac. And on the 10th of December is coming the CCA annual holiday guide. So if you guys haven't subscribed to our mailing list, remember to subscribe tonight before or just, up, just after leaving the webinar or just on your phones, you can do that right away and you will have the holiday guide in your inbox on the 10th, coming soon. The Celiac Association, we work with your support. So remember, help us, donate us, especially this holiday season, empower families. Upcoming events, we have our next free gluten-free 101 webinar, again, supported generously by Dr. Shar, and run by dietitians and volunteers. It's one hour every month you wanna review, food, you want to talk about it, there are things that we would like to do, most welcome, join us. And our presenter for the evening, Dr. Laurie Parsons, a clinical associate professor of dermatology, division of dermatology in the Department of Medicine, University of Calgary, a specialist in skin disease and wound care. Also, medical director of the multidisciplinary complex wound care clinic at the Sheldon Schumer Center. Chair of the Canadian Contact Dermatitis Association, Chair of Undergraduate Dermatology Education, University of Calgary. Dr. Laurie Parsons, thank you very much for being with us today and helping us. You're welcome. Megan Donnelly, registered dietitian living in New York City is our second speaker for the evening. Currently, she's a nutrition service manager at Dr. Shah USA. She joined the Dr. Shah team in 2018, after completing her dietetic internship at James G. J. Peters VA Medical Center in New York. 
Megan feels passionately about improving quality of life for people following restrictive diets through culinary education and practical application of nutrition science. Her specialities include celiac disease, irritable bowel syndrome, and chronic kidney disease. Megan has a master's degree in nutrition and dietetics from New York University and a bachelor's degree in biology from the College of Holy Cross. Megan, welcome. Before we start, I'd like to review how the webinar works. All participants are muted so that we can enjoy the session. If you have questions for our presenters, please type them in the question and answer box and we'll get to them in the end of the presentation. I apologize in advance if we cannot get to some of the questions. You can email us your questions at info at celiac.ca and we'd be pleased to respond. There is a chat box available to chat between yourselves. However, I would like to request you, please do not ask questions via the chat box as we intend to use the questions in the question and answer box to answer all questions later. The session is recorded, so if you'd like to review the material later on, it will be available on the CCA's YouTube channel. Once it's ready to view, we'll send out the link. So remember, you get the link in our e-magazines and our newsletters, so remember to sign up. So now, I would like to request Dr. Laurie Parsons to share her slides and begin. Dr. Laurie Parsons. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much for being here and for allowing me to be part of this evening. Um, it's nice to be invited, so thank you very much. So, uh, dermatitis herpetiformis, but before we get started, I just want to, uh, one of the my passions and one of the things that I do is equality, diversity, and inclusivity. Um, I am part of the team at the Department of Medicine who um, oversees this in our, in our department and in our medical school. And um, one thing that's important for me is to know is to acknowledge that um, these traditional territories of the people of Treaty Seven region in southern Alberta, where I am coming from, so that includes the Blackfoot Confederacy as well as the Sutsina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda First Nation, and that the city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta in Region Three. And of course, this is where I am coming from tonight. So otherwise, I don't have any disclosures uh, relevant to this presentation. So I was going to, I had three kind of very brief objectives. I don't have a really long presentation. One was a really brief overview of dermatitis herpetiformis and uh, a little bit more briefly in its relationship to celiac disease um, and how we diagnose celiac, uh, tr sorry, how we diagnose dermatitis herpetiformis because I do not diagnose celiac disease. Um, a discussion of, a very brief discussion of the treatment options, which are actually, unfortunately, um, rather limited. And then to get into answering some specific questions from um, our audience participants. So first of all, I will let you know that all of the clinical slides I have come from a website called Visual Diagnosis. These are ones that are, um, there's no copyright infringement and through the University of Calgary, I have permission to use these slides. <laughs> so this is just a slide showing an overview of um, what dermatitis herpetiformis means to dermatologists. So on the body, we know that there is an association with celiac disease. We know it tends to occur in what we call an extensor. So that means on the outside part of the uh, arms, the outside part of the legs. So an extensor distribution, particularly over the elbows and the knees and over the buttocks. Rarely do we see involvement of the face, although you can, and rarely do we see involvement of the scalp. A lot of times when we see people with dermatitis or pediformis, although um, the vesicle, which is a little tiny water-filled blister, is uh, what we look for, because this is so itchy and people have scratched so much, that sometimes all we will see are excoriations, which are scratch marks, and erosion. So this is where the blisters used to be. All we'll see is a little scab over the surface of the skin. So really, it's the distribution the history of itch, that, and the itch is nasty. Uh, anyone who has DH can attest to the fact that the, the itch can be really, really bothersome. Um, th so those are the two things that give us a clue that we should be looking for um, dermatitis or pediformis. So this is a patient who um, luckily does show a few blisters. So you can see we're looking at the uh, extensor aspect of the arm here. Uh, just below the elbow on the extensor forearm. Sorry, I have a very sensitive touch screen. And you can see a little blister right there in the center. But we also see the 
this person has scratched so much that they have scratched the tops off the blisters in these areas. And these scratched blisters are what we most commonly see. I thought it might be interesting for you to see what it looks like under the microscope when we biopsy a patient with dermatitis herpetiformis. So just to orientate you to the slide, uh, this is skin. So all of this purplish area, pinkish purple in here is skin. This is the surface of your skin. That's the dead layer that's on the surface. And this down here, that's the cushion or the dermis that your skin sits upon. Now, what we do see, which is completely abnormal, is we see this fluid-filled blister right in the epidermis. And we see this infiltration of these inflammatory cells, which we call neutrophils. And this neutrophilic inflammatory condition is really typical of dermatitis herpetiformis. Um, so this is what we will see under the microscope when we take a skin biopsy of dermatitis herpetiformis. So this is a patient that we see pretty typical involvement on the knees. So we are seeing excoriation. So this is the scab that you can see on the surface. We're seeing a lot of areas of red and that red is where the inflammation is slowly starting to resolve away. But you can see on the background of this red, we see lots of new excoriations here. So this is a patient with ongoing flaring of their skin disease. So what is dermatitis herpetiformis? Well, it's a cutaneous manifestation. So when you have gluten allergy, and I think we're going to be seeing a lot more in the future, this definition between gluten sensitivity and gluten allergy. But when you have a true allergy to gluten and you're producing an antibody to gluten, that antibody to gluten is what causes this rash in the skin. And about 90% of patients who have this skin disease will have evidence of what we call a gluten-sensitive enteropathy. And that means if you do a, colo a colonoscopic examination, so you put that colonoscope up inside of a, a patient's um, intestine, and you go to the small intestine, and you will, if you take biopsies of the small intestine, you will see that the small intestine is being affected by um, this effect of being allergic to gluten. Um, and so normally we will see these little villi or these little out pouches, which are, that's the normal way that your uh, colon should, or your um, small bowel should look. And with celiac disease or this enteropathy, that gets flattened because of this allergy. But even though 90% of patients will have evidence of this gluten-sensitive enteropathy on biopsy, only about 20% will actually have intestinal symptoms. So only about 20% will complain of the pain and the bloating and the diarrhea or the constipation that can be associated with celiac disease, which is the bowel involvement. Both the skin disease and the bowel disease respond to gluten restriction, and they tend to recur with the institution of a gluten-containing diet. So gluten is definitely, or that allergy to that protein is definitely the factor behind all of these manifestations that you see with both the bowel disease and the skin disease. When we're trying to diagnose dermatitis herpetiformis, we actually have four criteria that we will use. First of all is the clinical presentation. So these itchy bumps and blisters, um, which occur on the, um, or, or they might be excoriated bumps on extensor surfaces. So elbows, knees, wrists are another place that we can see it. Really severe involvement can actually have large blisters that you can see um, on the lower back and the buttocks is classic and on the back of the neck, um, close to the hairline. These are all uh, classic places that we will see um, these lesions. Uh, then we expect to see pathology specific for dermatitis or pediformis. So all patients who you suspect of having DH should have a skin biopsy done. And that skin biopsy is done for regular histopathology, which is the photo that I just showed you, as well as um, for special stains, which we call immunohistochemistry. And on the immunohistochemistry, we expect to see these deposits of um, an immunoglobulin called IgA uh, right at the base of the skin, right where it joins onto uh, that cushion, which I call the dermis. Fourthly, patients should respond 
to dapsone therapy, and they should respond to restriction um, of uh, gluten. Now, of course, restricting gluten can take months before it shows a significant improvement, but certainly um, using dapsone, which is an oral medication we use to treat dermatitis herpetiformis, usually within 72 hours, we're seeing a significant improvement in the itch. Now, it's important to note that the bowel disease does not respond to dapsone therapy, only the skin disease. So people will ask, is there a cure? And unfortunately, we do not have a cure for dermatitis herpetiformis. Uh, we consider it a lifelong condition. We do know that the course can wax and wane, so it can get worse and get better on its own. Um, we can see spontaneous remission in up to about 10% of patients, which is not really well understood. Uh, but most clinical remissions, most people who are getting significantly better with their skin disease, it all seems to be related to restricting dietary gluten in, um, ingestion. So getting that amount of gluten protein that they're ingesting really is the only cure that we have or the only significant improvement that we will have for dermatitis or pediformis. So just a little bit of history. It was first described by a Dr. Louis During at the University of Pennsylvania in 1884. And for the Americans amongst us, um, it was the first skin disease ever described by an American. So that's how significant dermatitis or pediformis has been in our history. So what about uh, who gets dermatitis or pediformis? What's the epidemiology? We know that people of Northern European origin seem to be um, most commonly affected. It's very uncommon to see in African Americans and in people of Asian descent. Uh, people can be very young. I've seen people two years of age uh, get it, and I've actually seen diagnosed patients as young as two with dermatitis or pediformis. And uh, the oldest patient has been in their 90s. It seems to occur a little more frequently in men uh, when you compare to women, but that's anywhere from 1.2 to 1.9%, 1.9 difference, um, depending on which study that you look at. But it's slightly more frequent in men. So we do know there's often a strong genetic association. So I have seen patients uh, with dermatitis or pediformis who when they went looking in their family did find a history of celiac disease or they found someone who always had tummy troubles and then knowing that their relative had dermatitis or pediformis, they went and had a colonoscopy and they were diagnosed with the celiac disease. Some degree of gluten sensitive enteropathy, we've also already mentioned that is almost it's found in 90% of patients when you do that small bowel biopsy. Um, and we do know that you get, uh, when we do our biopsies, our skin biopsies, we see this immunoglobulin, this IgA deposition. Um, it's called within the papillary dermis, which is the upper layer of the skin. And this is actually essential for our diagnosis. So um, someone asked me in the chat to, comment on iodide and uh, dapsone or iodide ingestion in uh, dermatitis or pediformis. And one of the things that we do know is that ingestion of iodide in significant quantities certainly can lead to worsening of people's uh, dermatitis or pediformis. We also know that topical application of iodide, if you have normal skin, but you do, you do have an underlying um, the diagnosis of dermatitis or pediformis. If we actually apply topical iodide directly onto normal skin, we can actually produce lesions that are histologically identical to the patient's dermatitis or pediformis lesions uh, that come from ingesting gluten. Uh, now, exactly why this happens is not 100% sure. Uh, maybe our dietitian has a little bit more insight as to why that might happen. And I'm really hoping our dietitian is gonna talk a little bit about, uh, that's Megan, we'll talk a little bit about um, what foods are rich in iodine and how can we avoid them. Dapsone is a, a very old drug it's been around uh, since um, the early part of the last century. And we do know it has a significant effect on neutrophil function. So do you remember when I showed you that slide of um, the histopathology of dermatitis or pediformis? And I said that that infiltrate that we see, that cellular infiltrate, which is part of that inflammatory response to gluten, we, it's, they're neutrophils. And those neutrophils, um, in order to get out of the bloodstream, 
and into the skin to cause this reaction, they're actually following um, uh, these biochemical markers, which we call chemokines. And this process of moving from the bloodstream to the skin is called chemotaxis. And we know that dapsone affects chemotaxis of neutrophils. It can actually stop them from leaving the bloodstream and coming to the skin. And it's when they come to the skin that these neutrophils cause this intensely itchy reaction in the skin. So dapsone works by inhibiting chemotaxis, preventing the neutrophils from coming to the skin and starting this inflammatory reaction. So it's not a cure for dermatitis or pediformis, but it helps to control the symptoms of dermatitis or pediformis. The exact mechanism by which it does this is not 100% known, um, but it probably relates, as I said, to how these neutrophils follow this chemical trail from the bloodstream to the skin. So there are some disorders, associated disorders, um, which can be found with dermatitis or pediformis. Uh, one is thyroid disease, particularly something called Hashimoto's thyroiditis and diabetes mellitus. Now it's important to note that both Hashimoto's thyroiditis and diabetes mellitus, especially type one, are also autoimmune diseases. And it's felt that this autoimmune disease association with dermatitis or pediformis might be that the person is genetically susceptible to develop autoimmune disease. So it's not so much that the dermatitis or pediformis causes the Hashimoto's thyroiditis or causes diabetes mellitus, but it's that these autoimmune diseases are seen more commonly in people who also have dermatitis or pediformis. Um, one of the um, malignancies or the malignancy that can be associated with uncontrolled um, gluten enteropathy is a, a form of lymphoma or enteric lymphoma, enteric meaning intestinal lymphoma. But we do find that if we can get patients to adhere to their gluten-free diet, it significantly protects them against developing lymphoma. So what happens with a lymphoma is anytime you overstimulate the immune system and it's working really, really hard to try and um, in its response to gluten, this protein gluten, it can actually undergo go a malignant transformation and move to a benign um, lymphoma, sorry, uh, lymph response to an actual lymphoma, which is a cancer of these cells. Um, so adhering to these gluten-free diet products um, can actually, you know, minimize the amount of inflammation. And anytime that this happens, uh, it really makes a significant difference in protecting patients who have this gluten enteropathy against developing this lymphoma. So it's another reason we try to get our patients with dermatitis herpetiformis to try and adhere to a strict gluten-free diet. Um, so what kind of other investigations can we do? Well, we do know that we do have a commercially available right now in Canada. Um, we can do blood work for these anti-endomycelial antibodies, and they're very specific for celiac disease and dermatitis or pediformis. About 80% of patients with dermatitis or pediformis and 95% of patients with active celiac disease do have anti-endomycelial antibodies that we can identify in their blood. And one of the things that we have found is that the level of these antibodies can indicate the severity of the gluten-sensitive enteropathy. So it can give us a very good idea of how well patients are doing in terms of adhering to a gluten-free diet and getting that improvement in their small bowel. Um, so we can actually do serial levels of anti-endomycelial antibodies for this. Uh, mostly, however, we rely on the clinical response. Do people feel better? Do their tummy troubles get significantly better? And does their skin disease significantly improve? Um, and that to us is often mostly what we do in uh, knowing how well people are doing with their dietary gluten restriction. So treatment, as I said, treatment is a little disappointing because we really only have two choices uh, right now for dermatitis or pediformis. And that's oral dapsone, which is that oral medication that patients take every single day, or adhering to a gluten-free diet, or sometimes doing a little bit of both. We know when we give patients dapsone, and long before we were um, able to recognize the um, biopsy 
um, changes in the skin that were diagnostic of dermatitis or pediformis. Uh, the disease was often diagnosed uh, by giving patients a trial of Dapsone. So if a patient came in and was really itchy, um, the physician would give them a prescription for Dapsone. And if the Dapsone relieved the itch in 48 to 72 hours, then that actually was the diagnosis or the diagnostic criteria for dermatitis or pediformis. Um, these days, we really rely on our biopsies uh, because we don't want to give patients Dapsone if they don't need it. And generally, when we stop Dapsone, the lesions usually abruptly recur within 24 to 48 hours of stopping the drug um, if patients have not been um, avoiding uh, the ingestion of gluten. I will say, uh, going back to the gluten-free diet, that when I first started practicing a little over 20 years ago, patients really had um, very little choices when it came to gluten-free diets. Um, and so the, the, the recent explosion of gluten-free food options, um, I think has made a significant improvement in the quality of life for my patients who have dermatitis or pediformis. A few things that you do need to know is that patients who do have face involvement or scalp disease, uh, they can be harder to treat. By harder to treat, I mean when you give them oral Dapsone or when they follow a strict gluten-free diet, they do notice uh, improvements quicker everywhere else on their body except for their face and the scalp. For these patients, getting them to break the little blisters and then applying a very potent topical corticosteroid in a gel or a liquid formation formula uh, may actually help significantly with the symptoms of itch that they're having. So what about patient support? Well, um, in Canada, as you know, we have our Canadian Celiac Association, uh, which can be really helpful uh, in trying to get patients uh, started on a gluten-free diet, uh, help them figure out uh, where they're going wrong if they're having flare-ups, and um, you know, just help generally with support. Um, then there's the Gluten Intolerance Group, which I believe is an American group, and this is their website. Um, and they also help patients, again, with uh, gluten-free recipes and resources about uh, gluten-free diet. Uh, and the Celiac Disease Foundation, and this is their website, um, they can also be very helpful as well. So you have lots of on online resources that you can use to start um, if you think that you have a gluten uh, enteropathy or, or dermatitis or pediformis. Okay, now some popular questions that seem to arise are, um, Will you lose weight on the gluten-free diet? Right. So unfortunately, not necessarily. Uh, most people with celiac disease, when they go on a strict gluten-free diet, may actually gain weight because they start to feel better. Their bowel starts to work better uh, as it heals from, you know, being almost, you know, poisoned with gluten. And now they can absorb nutrients again. Um, and sometimes when you switch to some of these gluten-free options, uh, they are high in carbohydrates and higher in um, uh, calories um, than the naturally gluten-free diet, such as lean meats, poultry, fish, and fruits. Um, and so patients will sometimes uh, gain weight, and you have to be careful uh, with the carbs uh, if you are worried about your weight. Um, that naturally gluten-free diet uh, is optimal for weight management, so it means reducing the amount of carbs that you eat, and that will not contribute to weight gain um, if you can avoid those high-calorie gluten-free substitutes, uh, which are sometimes seem to flood the market. And I'm gonna ask Megan if she will comment on that a little bit later. So are people with celiac disease always skinny? No. About 40% of people diagnosed with celiac disease are overweight at their time of diagnosis, and only 4 to 5% are underweight. So you can't look at someone and say, oh, you can't have celiac disease because you're not a skinny person. So what does gluten-free actually mean? So um, gluten-free actually means that you've got 20 parts per million of gluten or less in a food. And how much of a gluten-free food can you actually eat without getting sick? Because there still is some gluten in gluten-free. Um, and so that if you eat at five pounds of gluten-free food per day, then you're going to um, get past 
um, that amount of gluten that is actually safe for you to ingest. Because according to the latest research, um, ingesting 50 milligrams of gluten per day or more will cause the intestinal damage for people with celiac disease. So trying to keep it under 50 milligrams a day is important. So is it safe to work in a bakery if I'm not eating anything? So for people um, who are both dermatitis or pediformis and celiac disease, working in a bakery where there's a lot of flour that seems to be floating in the air, uh, you can breathe in just as much gluten and it's very similar to ingesting it, just as if you were swallowing it. Um, although it can't be absorbed through the skin, it can be breathed in. So it is not, it's not an ideal job for someone who, is, um, who has celiac disease or dermatitis or pediformis. So do you have to give up coffee and corn on a gluten-free diet? My understanding is no, that coffee and corn are gluten-free. I will ask uh, Megan to comment as to whether or not GMO corn is also gluten-free because I do not know that answer. Uh, but there's no, otherwise there's no scientific evidence to show that uh, pure coffee or corn will contain pr proteins that cross-react with gluten. Will glutenase and other gluten cutter products help those with celiac disease? Um, and will it help them to digest gluten? So can you take these enzymes and ingest gluten at the same time? But right now there's no good scientific evidence that these products um, will help digest gluten if you take them together with gluten. Uh, anecdotally patients may notice a difference, um, but I don't, I don't, uh, I don't think it's recommended at this time for patients with celiac disease. Do I have to use special gluten-free soaps and shampoos? You don't gluten-free soaps and shampoos. Oh, okay, Dr. Parsons is back. Yeah, where did I? Where did you lose me? Um, In the questions? Yes. Okay, how about this one? The bakery. The next. The next. Yes. The cutters. This one. Yes. Okay. So did you hear that I said that if you're celiac disease, it, it, the shampoos and lotions don't matter, but lipstick and lip products should be gluten free. Uh, but if if you're dermatitis or pediformis, you should be using gluten-free soaps, personal care products, such as soaps, shampoos, and lotions. So there's a difference if you're dermatitis or pediformis, you should use special gluten-free soap, shampoos, and lotions. But if you're celiac disease, it's not, it's not as important. Okay. If I have DH in personal care, oh, I just answered that. There we go. All right. Okay. And I think I've come to my last question and I'll be happy to entertain uh, questions from the audience. Uh, Dr. Parsons, we will take questions from the audience in the end, but I'd now like to thank you very much for this lovely uh, information. And I would like to ask uh, our registered dietitian, Megan Donnelly, to please come forward and take the stage. Okay, Gory, can you just see my, can you confirm you can see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen and we can hear you. Please go All ahead. All right, great. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Parsons, for that wonderful presentation. Um, and I'm going to take some of your questions right off the bat before we get into the diet. So just right away, um, GMO corn is gluten-free. All corn is gluten-free, so that's great. Um, and then just, you know, reminding everyone that, you know, the, the only treatment for celiac disease is the gluten-free diet, as Dr. Parson said, and that, you know, so anything that's, you know, going to cut your um, gluten intake, you know, taking a pill, there's nothing like that on the market right now that's been approved for celiac disease. So with that, I'll get into the presentation, and if there's any more questions, we'll get them all at the end, I hope. Um, 
So just briefly, and I know we sort of talked about this and many of you on this call are aware, but what is celiac disease? It is a is an abnormal immune response to gluten ingestion that affects about 1% of the population worldwide. Um, it does seem to be more prevalent in women than men, and it's a little bit higher rates among people with other autoimmune conditions. It does have a genetic component. Um, however, that being said, you know, the genetic, just because you carry the gene for celiac disease does not necessarily mean you will develop active celiac disease, but everyone who has celiac disease does carry the gene. So that's important to know. And it can be diagnosed at any age. So Many, pe many people say to me, oh, I never had it as a kid, so it can't be gluten, and, and that really isn't true. So it could, the, whatever, for whatever reason, the gene can be turned on and become active disease at any age. What happens internally is that your small intestine becomes damaged due to, due to the gluten ingestion. So this is what a normal, healthy, small intestine looks like, and this is what a damaged small intestine looks like. So you see these fingers, finger-like projections, think they're fingers, they grab onto nutrients. In celiac disease, they become flattened and you can't grab onto nutrients. Now we're gonna talk about DH specifically in this presentation, but this is a typical presentation of what's going on inside your body when you consume gluten and you have celiac disease. And again, the only treatment is lifelong adherence to a gluten-free diet. So they're just first, Right off the bat, you know, there's over 200 signs and symptoms of celiac disease, and I think it's pretty safe to say that nobody presents with the disease in exactly the same way. And this can be really challenging when trying to diagnose something like this. So there are these typical gastrointestinal symptoms or GI symptoms, as you'll see on the slides of flatulence, bloating, indigestion, diarrhea, abdominal pain, and the list goes on. And when I say GI, I mean anything that's like digestive or stomach issues. However, there are a lot of non-GI symptoms, and I think this is where really the diagnosis gets tricky. Um, and there's some research that shows that these non-GI symptoms are more prevalent in adults, which I, again, I think, you know, when you have something like fatigue or anemia, it can be really challenging because those can be related to a lot of other things. Um, but, you know, for the purposes of this presentation today, we're going to focus on this one, which is dermatitis or pediformis or DH. Um, as Dr. Parsons really well described, it's, it's, it's a skin rash or itchy skin, and I'm, I'm going to show you a little bit more about it specifically. Um, but this is a really significant complication that might not be necessarily picked up right away unless you're working with an experienced dermatologist in this area. Um, and just to review diagnosis, this is a typical presentation diagnostic requirements. So there is typically a blood test involved, a biopsy of the small intestine involved and genetic testing. However, this is different for people who present with DH only. So we'll get into that in a little bit, but just setting it up that, you know, this, this is different than the typical presentation of the disease. So uh, you can kind of think of this as, uh, you know, a basically celiac disease of the skin. It's, it's still celiac disease, but it's a different presentation than what we would normally think of, which is those classic GI symptoms. Um, you know, this has been around forever, as was mentioned in the presentation prior, um, but it's really characterized by an intensely itchy, blistering rash that can occur anywhere on the body. And you'll see it a lot on the elbows, knees, buttocks, but it can be so itchy that, you know, it causes a lot of irritation and scratching until bleeding occurs. And I think this can even confuse the diagnosis even more if it starts to look a little different than it normally would because of a lot of irritation. So it's definitely a significant quality of life issue. Um, actually, the research shows that it affects about 10% of people with celiac disease and interestingly seems to affect males more than females, which is unlike the prevalence data that I mentioned before. And it also presents more often in adults than children and adolescents. And when I was reading the research for this presentation, it was interesting to me. They said that this delayed onset indicates that the long-term stimulation of the immune system by gluten is needed to produce the symptoms of DH. 
It's important to note, however, that presence of DH does not correlate with intestinal severity or damage. So in fact, some people with DH have normal small intestine biopsies. And so as I mentioned before, that's a, that's a standard criteria for diagnosis. Um, what's even more confusing is that these blood tests for celiac disease are also based on small intestine associated antibodies. So patients may not test positive with the traditional blood test. Therefore, it's super important that the diagnosis of DH is based on the presence of the rash in a skin biopsy, which should all be done by an experienced dermatologist so that it's not confused with other conditions. And if you have a positive diagnosis of DH, keep in mind that you do have a positive diagnosis of diagnosis of celiac disease, no matter how normal, quote, your small intestine appears. So you might not experience any painful GI symptoms that are typically associated with celiac disease, but this is a different presentation of the disease. So where does it come from? And I think the first thing is important to understand its cause, which is gluten. Um, so gluten is a storage protein complex found in wheat, barley, and rye. It's in a lot of manufactured foods as well because it's used as a binding agent in breads, doughs, pastas, and cakes, and it is um, helpful for improving the texture, flavor, and moisture retention in food. So this is a wheat kernel, and the gluten is actually a large part of the protein content in this wheat kernel. So these are just the different parts, but um, the, the proteins in the, I believe, the germ. So dermatitis or performance and, and celiac disease, you know, it comes from, as I mentioned, a genetic predisposition, prolonged exposure to gluten, and an immune response. In susceptible individuals, the chronic stimulation of the immune system by gluten produces IgA antibodies that bind to the skin and cause this reaction. Tissue transglutaminase, which is an enzyme involved in the setting off reactions that destroy the, the villi, so in typical presentation, they may also play a role because these are present throughout the body. So basically what I'm getting at is that the form found in the skin appears to, appears to react with IgA antibodies and sets off an immune reaction that causes inflammation, itching, and blistering. Okay, so as I mentioned, management really does require strict lifelong adherence to the gluten-free diet. And, you know, as Dr. Parsons mentioned before, it's really important that a gluten-free diet is a healthy gluten-free diet. So this should not be a diet that is, you know, full of processed foods and unhealthy treats and only processed foods, you know, really should include a balance of fruits, vegetables, nuts, beans, legumes, some naturally gluten-free grains and starches, including, you know, rice, corn, quinoa, millet, and buckwheat, and also your proteins. So fish, eggs, meat, poultry, dairy, all of these things in their natural state are really healthy and really important for a well-balanced diet. That is not to say that you know, you need to include every single one of these, but really, you know, to avoid some of the weight gain and some of the, you know, just generally general conditions that come with following an unhealthy diet, you should be consuming the same types of foods as the general population, just with a gluten-free um, and gluten-free grains instead. Um, it's also important that manufactured foods that are included in the gluten-free diet, that they contain less than 20 parts per million of gluten, which I'll go over in a second. So what I always tell people is that the basic principles of the diet should not change. It, they should be rich in a variety of healthy whole foods. Um, so I do wanna touch on what the international standard is for gluten-free, um, because I, I think this is important to understand. The gluten-free label um, means that the product must contain less than 20 parts per million of gluten. But like, what does this mean? I think it's confusing. And so I hope, I'm hoping I can explain it a little bit. So basically, well-established studies from all over the world show that 10 milligrams of gluten per day is a safe threshold that will not cause harm in the majority of patients with celiac disease. And based on that information, experts have conducted exposure estimations from 
uh, to gluten from grain containing foods and foods with grain derived ingredients like flour. So they took into consideration the various rates of food consumption by different sex and age groups and um, they concluded that if gluten was present at levels not exceeding 20 parts per million or 20 part 20 milligrams per kilogram then exposure to gluten would not exceed that 10 milligram threshold for all age groups and so that's a complicated way of saying that you know they've looked at the data and they've shown that the 20 parts per million standard if every food consumed was below that standard then people would still not reach that safety threshold of 10 milligrams. Um, in addition, I think it's important to point out that Health Canada has some specific requirements that are a little bit different maybe than some other countries, but in a good way. They're, they're more transparent, I think, certainly than in the US. So Health Canada requires a complete list of ingredients on the label in common language. Only foods that have been specially made to meet the needs of individuals who need to follow a gluten-free diet in order to protect their health are allowed to carry that claim. Um, that's a little different than in the US. So in the US, there's a little bit less standardization on who can claim that their product is gluten-free. Basically, it's just that they meet the 20 parts per million threshold, but um, they don't necessarily have to be specially formulated for people who need to follow a gluten-free diet. So slight difference, but overall, if it's certified, it should be safe. And I'll explain that in a second. Um, and then the other point here is that they should be truthful and not misleading. So obviously we want transparency in our labeling, but it doesn't always go without saying. Okay, and so when you're looking at a product and you want to identify the presence of gluten, there's really three places you need to be looking every time you're shopping. So first is for a gluten-free label. There are a lot of gluten-free labels out there. These are some of the more common ones. This one on the left here is one that we use at Char. These are some other ones I found that might be available in Canada. So um, this GF is a really common one in the US at least. So, you know, there's a lot of different gluten-free labels, but if it's on the front of the pack, keep in mind, these are, um, these have, if they're claiming to be gluten-free on the package, then it is, you know, they, they've been certified by an independent party who has determined that they meet the standards for gluten-free. However, it's still important to check the ingredients list and the allergens list. So first I have the allergens list here. Um, some packaging has a list of common allergens found in the product and that's required in some countries. And some of these, for example, are wheat, soy, egg, nuts, milk. Um, and this can be a quick way to rule out something if the package says like contains wheat. But um, However, you know, a lack of allergen labeling does not necessarily mean that the product is gluten-free. At least in the U.S., these are voluntary um, listings. Well, you have to claim the top eight allergens, so you have to claim something like soy and wheat, for example, but if it says something confusing like um, produced in a facility that also produces wheat, for example, that's a voluntary labeling. It may not be on every single package that you read. So, it's important that you're looking for the gluten-free label for you know, some confidence that they've met the safety standards for to be able to claim that. You wanna check the allergen listing, make sure there's nothing going on there. And then you also wanna check the ingredients lists. And I think this is you know, something that people maybe aren't always so careful about, but checking to make sure that what they claim is actually true. So you wanna see here barley malt, um, wheat, so those are some ingredients that would not be safe. You want to check for obvious ingredients, of course, so things on this list. Um, but if there's not a gluten-free label on the product packaging, we do still recommend reading the ingredients label thoroughly and the allergen statement. And you want to check for hidden questionable ingredients and some ingredients that have the potential to um, contain gluten. And, I, and always be looking at how the manufacturer labels that. Um, and, you know, as this is not going to come as a surprise to many of you, but, um, you know, there's always some questions when you're dining outside of the home. And so understanding that gluten can be present in, in when you're dining out, especially when it's been, we call it cross-contamination or cross-contact. So basically think gluten is transferred from a gluten-containing food to a gluten-free food, thus contaminating it. 
so important when you have celiac disease that you are advocating for yourself. And, you know, this is, even if you present with mild symptoms, even if you think, oh, it's just my skin that's going to be affected, this is causing actual immune immune response. It's causing damage. It's an autoimmune condition. So you do need to be making sure when you're dining out that they're using designated condiments, the servers and the kitchen staff are washing their hands thoroughly. You should be washing your hands thoroughly before eating. I think, you know, in the pandemic, more important than ever. Um, washing utensils between use with gluten-free and non-gluten-free foods. They should be, you know, put in the dishwasher ideally with soap. Um, you want to use separate cooking water and fryers to prepare gluten-free and non-gluten-free foods. And then in general, avoiding salad bars, bulk bins, and prepared areas because there, as we know, there's a lot of dropping that happens in between those. So probably safer to avoid those. This is not an all-inclusive list. These are just some basic basic um, rules to consider when you're dining outside of the home or even when you're dining inside of the home when you're sharing a cooking environment. There, you know, not everybody can have a dedicated gluten-free kitchen at their home or, or if they do, you know, they don't necessarily have it when they go to grandma's house for the holidays or whatever. So um, some good tips to keep in mind and educate your, you know, your family members on is that when you're cooking meals in a shared kitchen, you always want to prepare the gluten-free food first so that it has less risk of being contaminated. Seal it up, put it away from the other foods that you're preparing. You want to cut gluten-free foods first with clean knives and soap and water, probably best to wash them before using them, and definitely don't use a knife with any visible residue. Um, you want to use fresh, clean water to cook gluten-free pasta, and you want to make sure all your kitchen surfaces and equipment is thoroughly washed in between uses. And, you know, again, this is important for anyone with celiac disease, even if they don't present with a lot of symptoms from small gluten exposure. So, you know, any gluten exposure can cause damage, whether you present with DH or typical um, symptoms or you don't really present with symptoms. It's important for everybody who has the disease because this is an autoimmune disease. Um, so just, you know, kind of wrapping up and hopefully I'll get to some of the, the questions that you guys were asking because they were really great questions, but DH can take weeks, months, or years to fully clear up. It's a significant immune response and your body takes time to heal. This is also true if you have a small intest, if you have significant small intestinal damage. I mean, it's, it's just going to take time. Think about it. If you've been consuming gluten for years, it might take a while for your, your body to heal and that's okay. It just means that you need to be extra careful about following the gluten-free diet and following up with your doctor to make sure that you're, and your dietitian to make sure that you're doing it well and avoiding some of those hidden exposures. I will say again, the gluten-free diet is the only cure, so you need to stick to it to manage the disease. Um, and this is getting at the iodine question, so I'm happy that that came up before. Um, and, I, and I will reiterate, in some people, there seems to be a relationship between DH and iodine ingestion. And for those of you who don't know, this is sometimes added to the diet in the form of iodized salt. So in the US, um, and I believe Canada as well, it's, iodine is actually added to a lot of the salt in our country um, to prevent goiter, which is abnormal enlargement of the thyroid gland, and it can cause you know, developmental issues, growth issues, and other health issues. So for unknown reasons, it seems like people with DH may be sensitive to iodine, and it can prevent the DH from clearing up if you're consuming a diet that's high in iodine. So from what I've seen in the literature, it seems like you can maybe reintroduce it later on once the DH clears, and it, this is a somewhat rare presentation, but um, I think this is something you really need to be working close with your dietitian on to help you navigate and also your, your dermatologist as well. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't necessarily eliminate, it's, it's going to be pretty hard to avoid iodized salt if you were in a country that, you know, does it automatically. So focus on some of the higher sources of iodine. So shellfish, kelp, which is in sushi, and also some dairy products, you know, those are more significant sources of iodized salt. So potentially maybe you can eliminate those and help your body heal. Um, but again, this is something that I would definitely be working with both your doctor, your dietitian, seeing where you can 
troubleshoot, I, it would be um, a somewhat rare presentation for sure. And then, you know, so important, be working with your dermatologist to manage the uncomfortable DH symptoms with medications or creams or whatever it is that's going to help you heal. They are the experts. I think, you know, realizing the dietitian can help you manage the diet and help that and that's going to help your skin condition, but really all skin conditions should be assessed by a dermatologist. So dietitians can help you have the best diet that's going to make you feel better, but you also need to be being followed by, you know, your doctor and your dermatologist. Um, and these are just some resources, not necessarily on DH specifically, but we do have recipes, we have articles, we we have some ebooks. We've got all kinds of good stuff on our website. So if you have questions in addition to looking at, you know, the CCA website or some other nonprofit organization websites, you can definitely check out the SHAR website. We, you know, this is all we do. So we're, we have a lot of info on there and a lot of good recipes for you all to try. And with that, I guess we can go to questions, Corey. Perfect. Thank you so much, Megan. That was really good. So um, amazing view, quite balanced on both sides of the medication, the treatment, the med food. I'm sure it was very helpful for everybody. Uh, please make sure to join our CCA moderated Facebook group, sign up for our newsletters. Remember the latest holiday guide is coming up pretty soon and um, check us out on our YouTube channel. This particular presentation is being recorded and will also go on our YouTube channel. So if you want to review any aspects of it, feel free. And now I would like to go on to the questions. So we have a lot of questions that have come in and um, let's start with the first one. Okay. Oh, somebody's asked on nightshade vegetables. I find that even when I'm not recovering from being gluten, that I can only handle a limited amount of tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, eggplants, otherwise I itch. Not nearly as badly, but in the same places I get gluten. For me, that's primarily my fingers and hands and arms. So what would be the effect of nightshade vegetables on DH, Megan? Yeah, so, you know, this is an interesting question, and I've seen it come up a little bit recently. So, you know, really there's no evidence that nightshades trigger any sort of celiac disease-related reaction. So I think it's possible that, um, you know, you're just maybe sensitive for the to the nightshade vegetables for other reasons, and, you know, those those places where you get your um, typical skin reactions, it, it's possible that that's just also, you know, where you're when you have an inflammatory response, that's where you're going to, your triggers are. So I think it's probably not related to any celiac disease specific issue because that would be a gluten related issue, but possibly just an inflammation related issue. Oh, okay, so Dr. Shah, uh, Dr. Parsons, we have a question. What happens if you've been diagnosed with an IgA deficiency? Sorry, I, I would have no idea what that would mean in, um, without knowing the full history and the symptoms. So I'm sorry. Okay, so next question. Do scars remain on the skin? If someone has been on a gluten-free diet for years for DH, can the test still affirm gluten-caused DH? Are there other consequences of skin fragility after example, developing eczema or psoriasis? Um, so I can sort of take the first part of that. So um, like I said, if someone's been on the gluten-free diet for years, um, you know, you need to be following a gluten-free diet in order to be diagnosed, uh, sorry, you need to be following a gluten-containing diet in order to be diagnosed with celiac disease. So if you've been on the gluten-free diet for years, you probably wouldn't be presenting with DH. It probably would be another skin condition. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so, well, how would you know soaps are gluten-free? So uh, you would need to uh, read labels and look to see if there's anything in there that can, could contain a gluten protein. Um, brands like Dove and Paul Mitchell and Suave, which are readily available in Canada, Aveda is another one. They, they will say that 
you know, they are very good about listing their ingredients and you can look and have a look at that. Aveda does have gluten-free um, uh, choices. Uh, most of them are gluten-free unless they have uh, oatmeal in them. Okay. Um, next question is, can you have both BH and psoriasis? And if so, how to distinguish and treat each? Of course, you can have their two. Uh, DH is not a common disease, but psoriasis is relatively common. So it certainly is possible to have both diseases in the same patient. Um, a skin biopsy can help, as can treatment, in terms of trying to distinguish one from the other. Okay. Um, I have this question. I am on Avlosulfon slash Dapson for my DH. Have been on it for over 20 years. What long-term side effects does this present? There's no long-term side effects um, with being on a drug like that. There are, of course, um, in, some people are sensitive to Dapsone, and when you give them the drug, they can get sick from it. Um, everybody will get a degree of anemia on Dapsone because it does something to the way that your blood um, reacts with oxygen. And so you're, you're, you, you will destroy your red blood cells a little bit more quickly, so everyone gets anemic to some degree on Dapsone. But it's usually, um, it's, not something, it's something we watch, but it's not something we generally worry about. Uh, and there's another thing to it. And he's asking that I am now finding I'm in advently cheat my rectum, you know, is very sore and often I get bleeding. Is this normal? Um, bleeding without a cause is never normal. Um, I would certainly ask your family doctor to, or your physician to have a look and see exactly what's going on. Okay. Um, Next question I have is, I just finished two weeks of Zivaxim for SIBO. My understanding is this is common with celiac. I have BH. How do I handle a diet if it recommends to eat low FODMAX or at least a modified form? Thank you in advance. So. Um, yeah, so, well, it's a little more complicated than the answer I'm going to be able to give you, but definitely talk to a dietitian about this because um, we see a lot of people who need to follow a low FODMAP diet and a gluten-free diet. Um, so the good news is that wheat, barley, and rye are you know, the foods you need to eliminate on a gluten-free diet, but those foods are also high in FODMAPs. So a lot of times, um, you're, uh, some of the principles that you're already following will be appropriate for the low FODMAP diet. So I, it, you know, at least from a grains perspective, it should be relatively similar with a few other eliminations based on what your trigger foods are for the low FODMAP diet. So, you know, this is, a, this could, we could talk for an hour about that, but um, there's a lot of crossover, at least in the grains category. Okay, so next question is, I'm on Dapsin and have gone gluten-free and the rash is almost gone. However, my blood work and biopsy came back negative for celiac. Do you suggest moving forward as is, or is there something my doctor is missing? So the blood work and biopsy would depend on how, you know, how long you've been on the gluten-free diet before doing those, those tests. Because once you're gluten-free over time, the biopsy can come back as negative and the blood work can come back as negative. So um, I don't have an answer for that question otherwise. Um, I'm sorry. Okay, so next question is, um, can you talk about cleaning in the kitchen? Do you need a separate cloth? How can you be the safest? Yeah, so I would always recommend using separate cloths, sponges, but, um, you know, soap and water really does prevent um, gluten contamination in the kitchen. So as long as, you know, you're keeping things separate, I would say definitely use separate sponge, separate cloth. But other than that, um, it's just soap and water should be fine. Yeah. Uh, you haven't spoken about gluten-free oats. I got a reaction the first and second time I tried the oats when they were first available, has the product improved over time? Yeah, so oats, um, a lot of times oats can be contaminated in the field. So actually during harvesting and processing, um, I think uh, the first step would be 
to ease into oats. Um, people do this differently. We do it a little differently in the States. We do say certified gluten-free oats are okay for celiacs as long as you are looking for certified um, gluten-free oats. However, some people can still have a reaction. It, it's just not something not everyone tolerates well. So I would say, you know, start work with your dietitian, but look for certified gluten-free oats and start with maybe smaller servings. Hi, Megan. I'm, it's Melissa, um, ED for the CCA. Uh, CCA is just undergoing an um, international survey of the introduction of gluten-free oats um, in adults and kids. So I would recommend um, that the um, question asker um, follow the CCA and sign up for any updates because we'll be having some uh, more information coming out in the next several weeks and months. Oh, awesome. Yeah. And I know the, the U.S. guidelines, I'm in the U.S., I know they're a little different. So <laughs> that's helpful. Thank you. Um, next question is, for someone who does not have GI response to gluten and does not have and not had a pH flare uh, up since the following a gluten-free diet, is there any sort of checkup recommended to ensure the diet is working? For example, a blood test every few years? Uh, well, um, couple things. The the blood test is really more going to show if you're having a GI response, right? Because the, the blood um, markers are associated with your intestinal issues. So probably wouldn't help if you had a blood test, but you should definitely be following up with whoever your physician is that's managing your celiac disease. I think you should be following up with them at least annually just to make sure everything's okay. Okay, so we have this. How long do you need to be on a gluten-containing diet before having blood work done? My daughter was diagnosed and the rest needs testing. We have by nature cut some gluten from our diet, but still have gluten-containing pizzas, bread, etc. I, I So there's different ways to gluten challenge and, I, I, and it's you know, everyone's going to do it a little bit differently, but I, you know, I would say you need to be following for at least a few weeks and consuming at least a little bit of gluten. So I, you know, the, I worked with a GI once that did, you know, two slices of bread a day for three weeks, and that was how he managed the gluten challenge. So I, I wouldn't do that, however, until you speak to a GI and find out what, what they would like you to do, because it, it varies a lot and you don't want to overdo it. We do, actually, I'll cut it again um, for CCA, because I know, Megan, you're, you're in the U.S., so yeah. you're flying a little bit blind with what we recommend, but um, the CCA does have a gluten challenge document um, that if you go to our website at celiac.ca, uh, just type in gluten challenge in the search, and you can take that to your physician and have a discussion over it as to what's appropriate for you, but we've got some guidelines. A lot of questions that are here, like about the beers, barley malt extracts, and certification of foods. Guys, you can find all these answers on the Canadian Celiac Association's website. We have quite detailed documents and position statements on various topics. Uh, and a lot of questions can be answered directly from there. Um, I do have this one question, Dr. Parsons. Are there any concerns for people with CD and DH taking vaccines? I have to make sure all my medications are gluten-free. Uh, vaccines, there should not be a concern. Okay, perfect. And that's specifically in, in injected vaccines rather than oral ones, but I can't think of any oral vaccines that we even give now. Most of our vaccines, I think all our vaccines are injectables. Yeah, yeah there was one that you could inhale for um, influenza through the nose, but um, even that one is, we're, um, it's not being used this year in Canada. Okay. I think we've covered most of the questions. And uh, I, if there are more questions, feel free to email me at clientsupport at celiac.ca and I will send them to the concerned presenter for the evening to get you an answer if I can't find one for you. And I would also now like to thank all, all our, our participants for the evening for being with us here today, our presenter, Dr. Laurie Parsons, and Megan Donnelly, who took out precious time from their schedules to be here with us, and our sponsor for tonight's webinar, Dr. Shar, for supporting us. I wish you all health and happiness. Stay safe. This is a recorded webinar. We will soon send you all a link to review again. 
thank you very much for being here. And remember, CCA runs with your support. So if you liked it today, donate. Be there to support us like we are here for you all the time. Thank you very much. Good evening and stay safe.